So I travel to Washington every week from Bowling Green, Kentucky, where I live, and then I return at the end of the week, and I've been married 33 years as of last week. And I get home, and I think, you know, when I knock on the door, my wife lets me in, I think, well, she'll have my slippers, maybe a hug and a kiss, <laughs> maybe a martini. And you know what I usually get when I get home? I open the door, and you know what she says to me? How come Anthony Fauci's not in jail yet? <laughs> But it's not for lack of trying. I've referred him twice to the Department of Justice, but there is this guy over there, um, the Attorney General, Merrick Garland, who may be the most partisan Attorney General we've had. Uh, there used to be some sense of distance between the Attorney General and Presidents in politics, but I think there is no longer. And uh, we have the proof, we'd submitted the proof. Essentially, Anthony Fauci, in his own words, has admitted the truth. He lied in Congress, which is a felony, and we have the proof. It's in his own emails. It's in his own words. But if you look back in time and you want to know when the cover-up began, when the conspiracy began, it really began January 31st of 2020. The virus had only been out a couple weeks in China. The Chinese were still saying, oh, it's not transmitted by, between humans. This was months after the virus had really erupted. We know now that the virus started uh, in the lab, that the first three people sick, we actually know their names, worked in a lab in Wuhan. They worked for Dr. Xi, the one they call the great bat scientist. The first patient zero they actually think is Ben Hugh, a scientist who worked for. We know that because they declassified that in the Trump administration. They declassified that these three were sick. The x-ray findings were con consistent with COVID. There wasn't a test for COVID. They had a test for the first SARS-1, the one that was a pandemic back in 2003 and 2004, but they didn't yet have a COVID test. But they had all the signs and symptoms of it. Will we ever prove they had it? Well, we could have early on in the disease if they'd come forward and admitted the truth and subjected uh, serum for antibody analysis. We could have proved that they were the first patients. But all of the evidence points to that. We know the Chinese were dishonest in their death count. All likelihood, millions of people died in China, and yet there was no real uh, accounting for that. I begin the book by talking about a young ophthalmologist, uh, Leng Wang, who um, I say reminded me of myself. I was a young ophthalmologist a few years ago, and uh, he was idealistic, and he saw the pandemic coming and began reporting it. But in China, if you report the truth or reveal the truth, he was arrested. Uh, he was made to go through a struggle. He was made to shame himself and admit that uh, he had been guilty of spreading gossip or guilty of spreading rumors against the state. And then he dies. We don't say how he died necessarily. He appeared to have died from, from COVID. But in his age group, the death rate's like 0.004%. So for him to die was extraordinary. If he did die from COVID, it was still extraordinary for him. But I recount at the beginning because this scene was so striking that as they were sealing people and entombing people in their apartments, like they did in the Middle Ages, only three years ago in China, as they were sealing people in their apartments, people just were so lonely and distraught that they were coming out on their balconies. You saw it in Italy, you saw it in different places. But the way they responded to it in China should, should send shivers up your spine. In China, they sent drones. And in the soothing voice of a woman, the woman would say, suppress your soul's desire to be free. That's how they were responding. And I think most of us can kind of believe that that's the way a totalitarian government would respond. But we think we're better. We think, gosh, our government, when we're a free, we're a liberal democracy. We would certainly not react that way. But what we discovered, and what I discovered as I went through this, is that January 31st of 2020, the conspiracy began. And it began in a flurry of emails. Emails between Anthony Fauci and other virologists around the world. Emails between Anthony Fauci and a guy named Jeremy Farrar, who's sort of the Anthony Fauci of England, maybe the biggest dispenser of grants in all of Europe. The emails have a harried nature. You know how you can read emails between people and you can get a sense of that they're worried. You also get a sense that they're worried because they go on till three in the morning. They go on through midnight. His assistants are emailing Anthony Fauci and saying, hey, we see this paper, it's from Wuhan, and it's gain-of-function research, and it looks like we funded it, but it never went through the safety committee. 
mysterious. Never went through the safety committee, got approved, but we we're unsure how that could have happened. The emails have increasing uh, hairy nature. You get to midnight and Fauci's responding to his assistant saying, there will be duties, have your cell phone on, be up early, I will have duties for you in the morning. At three in the morning, Fauci sends an email uh, to somebody named Bob Cadlick. I didn't know who that was at the time. In fact, I didn't know that for a year or two till we were well into the book and then I met Bob Cadlick. Bob Cadlick was the head of the safety committee. But just like government is and just like government screws up so many things, the safety committee's secret. The name of the people that are supposed to review dangerous pandemic research so we don't create a pandemic is secret. The people on the committee are secret and so are their deliberations. I still have never seen their deliberations. But one thing I do know is only three grants were ever looked at and none of them were the grants in Wuhan. Three grants were looked at. But the email from Fauci to Bob Cadillac and three in the morning says this, hey, Here's an interesting article, and it looks like it came from animals. All the evidence looks like it came from animals. Nothing to see here. Why is he doing it? He's CYA. He's covering up because he knows that he was involved with funding this. Was this an accidental thing? Was this something Anthony Fauci just made a mistake, a judgment, and, well, we didn't get it reviewed? No, it's a lifelong philosophy for him because really the whole discussion and the debate over gain-of-function research, research where you take two viruses and combine the genetics of them to create something that doesn't exist in nature, that is potentially more dangerous, more lethal, or more contagious. This had been going on for a decade. It started with a, a famous research of the avian flu in the Netherlands in 2010. The avian flu, if you've ever seen when they have the reports in the news of killing of millions of chickens in, in primarily China, but other places, it's very contagious among chickens, but like most animal viruses, not very contagious to humans. But when it infects humans, it kills about 50% of the humans it infects. It's a bad disease. But like most animal viruses, it's adapted for its host, for chickens, for birds, and it's very transmissible. So a research in the Netherlands said, wow, wonder if we take the avian flu and we give it some mutations, if we could make it contagious through the air to mammals. And lo and behold, he did that. But people became alarmed. They're like, wow, this, is, this could be a, a recipe for terrorists to create something that could you know, kill off 50% of the population. And they debated over whether to publish it because they thought it could be a roadmap for terrorism. So the debate goes back and forth. And on one side are the good guys, and there are many of them you'll learn about in the book who are scientists, who are credentialed at many of the prestigious universities, and yet they were very worried about this. On the other side, Anthony Fauci and all of his colleagues that helped him in the cover-up. And Anthony Fauci actually says in 2012, he says that even if a scientist were to become infected, even if a pandemic were to occur from gain-of-function research, that the knowledge would be worthwhile. I would venture to say that the people who lost loved ones in COVID would probably disagree with him. So this is the way this begins. They're having conversations. The emails are going on in a frantic pace. Jeremy Farrar, the Anthony Fauci of England, is having discussions with his wife. His wife remembers 17 phone calls in one evening. She remembers telling him, and she's a scientist also, she says to him, maybe you should talk to your family. Maybe you should inform your family something about this in case something happens. They're really thinking, so they, and he never really intimates who's, go, who's going to kill him or who might kill him, but they're worried that he might be killed over this knowledge. He says he bought a burner phone. They all begin trying to use various forms of email that are not responsive. We have one of Fauci's assistants saying, well, don't use your government email, it'll get FOIA. They're FOIAing me to death. Don't use your government email. That's a crime. You remember Hillary Clinton, you remember all the discussions. The executive branch has to use government email. And yet there was this idea, we're just gonna go outside the boundaries of this to have these discussions. And this began in January, January 31st, February 1st. So there's a big phone call on February 1st. And in that phone call, we know the results of that because we finally got another email. We get these emails by drips and drabs over time. We get an email from Anthony Fauci of a Slack conversation, which is, I guess, a group texting mechanism. Yeah, the young people are nodding their head. I don't know what that is. <laughs> 
But in the summary of that email, he, he says, well, yes, we've all looked at it. So and so and so and so. All these famous virologists have looked at it. And looking at the sequence, this is not something we've seen in nature. It's really unusual. This category of coronaviruses typically don't have what's called a furin cleavage site, which is a, a site that allows them to enter into human cells well. This is just extraordinary. We think it's just, we think it looks like it was manipulated in the lab. And this is our conclusion. And we're very suspicious because we know in Wuhan they're doing gain-of-function research. Fast forward a year, he comes before my committee under oath, and he says the NIH has never, unequivocally, never, ever funded gain-of-function research. Now, part of the reason he can say that is they changed the definition of gain-of-function. They literally went to the website the day before the hearing and changed the definition. But even that isn't enough to weasel out of this. He's like, well, uh, animal viruses can't be gain of function. They have to be human viruses. Well, what if you take two different animal viruses and you put them together and now they infect humans? You don't know this in advance. So part of his definition was can't be gain of function unless we know it's going to gain function. Well, that's what the experiment is, is to see if it gains function. That's ridiculous. But we do know that certain of the backbones of viruses that we're combining have 10, 20% lethality. We know that there are some viruses that labs are working on, such as Ebola, Nipah virus, Marburg virus, that have 50% mortality. We quote a scientist in here who's a 30, 40 year uh, virologist who is in the Trump administration who says that he thinks this will happen again. But he thinks next time it could be 5% or 50%. If you've ever read about the Black Plague, you've ever read about the 14th century, it's hard to imagine what happens when a third of your people die. In those days, when a third of the people die, that's loss of knowledge, loss of know-how. If we had a third of our country or a 50% of the world die, we're talking about starvation, lack of clean water, constant and chronic fighting for what's left. We're talking about a disaster. We're talking about a risk to civilization. In fact, Kevin Esfeldt is a uh, scientist who does the CRISPR technology, trying to figure out how to fix genetic disease by inserting genes. And it's a, you know, we're not against technology. There's fabulous technology that's out there. He's one doing this research, but he says that the gain of function research is a risk that civilization shouldn't take. He believes, and so do other scientists, that we should look at this the same way we look at nuclear weapons. Right now, as we sit, you could leave here and go on the internet and order DNA to make polio virus. People can order DNA off the internet, and if you know what you're doing, you can make the polio virus. And you say, well, there can't be many people who know how to do this. He's done some estimates that says he thinks it might be 60 or 70,000 people in the United States. It's not just PhD virologists. It's technicians that work in their lab. You think there's not going to be a crazy person or a terrorist who decides to monkey around with this and then release it? Now, some people ask, after researching the book, do you think the Chinese did it on purpose? I think unlikely, maybe, but I think unlikely. And the reason I think it's unlikely is you'd probably put someone on a plane and there'd be only, you know, you wouldn't have it in your country. Wuhan was hit pretty hard and the disease was there. We also have this evidence. We do have evidence that a Dr. Zhou Yusin, who's a general, you know, when you have your general next to your name, it means you're also in the People's Liberation Army. You are part of the communist apparatus. He was working on a vaccine in 2019. In fact, something mysterious happens. In February of 2020, a month after they said it wasn't transmissible and there's nothing to see here, and they just said, look the other way, they have a vaccine in China in February of 2020. Nobody believes you can get one that fast. Even an mRNA, you can't do it that fast the first time around. There's no way. Now, they do think if the virus started in November, or if you had actually created the virus and you were trying to work on a vaccine to that virus, and then the virus got out, you could have been prepared. He creates a vaccine in February of 2020. That doesn't work very well. And in April of 2020, he mysteriously either falls or is killed. He falls from a building. He either jumps or was pushed. Two months later, we know he was working on a virus. We know he was working with Dr. Xi. We know that they knew how to do this research to take a coronavirus and stick a cleavage site in it, a human cleavage site, to make it more infectious for humans. We know they were doing this. 
Did our government help me find out any of this information? Absolutely not. They have hid everything from the very beginning, continue to hide documents to this day, and it's a rare Democrat, except for when I bludgeon them under duress that will help me.